Kia ora, talofa, namaste, haere mai, and welcome to our niche cast on a Tuesday, coming at you after another fabulous weekend of Aotearoa sporting action. We are from the niche cache, the niche-cache.com, where you can read about Aotearoa sport. Don't worry, if you can't read very good, we're here with your podcast, we're here with the uh, speaking in your eardrums, you can watch us on YouTube, you can catch the podcast on Apple or Spotify. But if you do like to read about Aotearoa sport, we got plenty of deep dives on our website, thenish-cage.com. Along with the Chatham Cup final, Kate Shepherd Cup reviews, there are National League previews for the men and women live on our website right now. There's also their reaction to the New Zealand Warriors defeating Newcastle Knights. That is live on the website right now. There is a Black Caps uh, thingy majig touching on a few key storylines about Black Caps cricket. That is live on the website right now. So check it out, the niche case, case.com. Check it in every day, every couple of days, however you want to do it. Just check into our website, the niche-case.com and read about Aotearoa sport. We also discuss Black Caps cricket, a lot of which was uh, came from my latest update to the Black Caps ODI mixer. We did dive into the Black Caps Cricketing Vista for our subscriber podcast. The subscriber podcast goes out to uh, the Patreon Fano and those with a paid Substack subscription. Patreon.com forward slash our niche case. Easy, basic, fabulous way to support the niche case straight up the guts. It's basically essentially two dollars a month i think with the exchange rate and all of that stuff but two dollars a month you're supporting the niche case straight up the guts you get x access to the subscriber podcast every week at the moment our subscriber podcast do have a cricket focus but as soon as you become a patreon member or you jam that paid substack subscription you tell us what you want us to talk about that's the point is that the subscriber podcast is to dive into some kiwi sporting topics that the patreon fano and paid substack subscribers want so check that out part that we do do our newsletter of every monday and friday full of aotearoa sporting notes nuggets and information via substack that is free to sign up through uh the nichecase.substack.com completely free Whack in your email address, niche cage, sent straight to you every Monday and Friday evening. And from there, you can upgrade to a paid Substack subscription to access our subscriber podcast as well. So we've got the website, the niche-cage.com. We've got our newsletter every Monday and Friday as well via Substack. If you do want to be extra generous, join the Patreon Fano or upgrade your Substack subscription to a paid subscription they help out us a lot but also just have a listen have a read subscribe on youtube follow us on twitter x and instagram and all that other stuff you're the uh there's a lot of just easy basic free generous ways you can support the niche cache as well funky old podcast coming at you today but we need to start with a dose of mindfulness and that dose of mindfulness is coming courtesy of uh, Monsieur Albert Einstein, Ooh. who said, peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. Nice little dose of empathy from Mr. Einstein there. Yeah, that you actually stole the words right out of my mouth. I was thinking, as soon as you said uh, through understanding, I was like, that's just empathy. That's just uh, offering peace by connecting with someone else rather than trying to keep the peace through control and power and that type of thing yeah every i um i i keep thinking of um i saw that quote from einstein just pop up on a thing and i'm like yep that's good enough i'm doing i'm taking that one that's a nice good uh concise um universal bit of bit of advice but also when I see Einstein's name now, I, I picture him as the, the he's in that, um, uh, in, in the Oppenheimer movie that came out a couple months ago. He, there's a character who, like 
well, Einstein is a character in it who has to talk about like the morality of whether they should continue trying to create nuclear weaponry, basically. And it reminds me of that as well, because he, he has a role in that movie, which basically means like uh, he's he's there to say, keep the peace, basically. It's a nice little like moral uh, standing there from, from Einstein, which seems to be quite consistent with what he was like in real life. Um, because he said stuff like that, which is nice. Uh, what did I say again? Let me read that again. Peace cannot be kept by force, it can only be achieved by understanding. So, get out there and understand a little bit of empathy with your fellow Kiwis in Aotearoa and around the world so we can at least generate a not, little not kill each other, yeah, yeah, just a splash of peace in this world, weird world that we live in. The, we will start with a bit of rugby league here. Obviously, the Warriors had a fantastic win over the Knights. And with also uh, Will Warbrick, Kawaro. Oh, yeah. He scored an excellent try for the Melbourne Storm as part of their victory over the Roosters. So we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into plenty of rugby league, plenty of observations there. But I, if you don't mind, I do want to have a little bit of a rant, rant, rant. Um, Please do. The stage is yours. There is this. It's it's so weird because I've been I'm kind of swinging between extremes here because during the pandemic, I was sharing this belief that the Warriors do not represent the state of rugby league in Aotearoa. Because during the pandemic, I'm just seeing. Uh, all these Aotearoa Kiwis eligible players shining at a high level. I'm seeing players recruited to Australian clubs from all regions across Aotearoa. We've got Northland, we've got Bay of Plenty, we've got Taranaku, we've got Wellington, we've got Canterbury, Griffin Names from Greymouth, Rocco Berries from Greytown. Like these are the places where NRL and NRLW talent is coming from. And the Warriors weren't winning. We know the Warriors have been shat on for a long time during the pandemic. And yeah, they, they for whatever reason, we know why they were operating at a severe disadvantage compared to every other NRL club. And the Warriors did not represent the state of rugby league in Aotearoa. That is still true. As we were in September, and I'm talking about Warriors in September. That hasn't happened in a while, but we're still talking about Warriors in September. So on the 19th of September, 2023, the Warriors are preparing for semi-final against the Broncos, and the Warriors are not the sole representation of rugby league in Aotearoa. There's this idea, and I, I understand it, because a lot of people, they're very surface level. They're looking at the Warriors. They're looking up at a fizz mount, fizzed up Mount Smart, and they're like, wow, what's happening there? The Warriors are so good for rugby league in Aotearoa. But there's so much else happening as far as, like, Kiwi NRL players and where they come from in New Zealand. The amount of young Kiwis in New Zealand who are recruited into Australian systems, let alone NRLW. The state of uh, NRLW expansion has brought in so many more ladies from Aotearoa, and all of which is to say the Warriors right now, they are just a piece in the New Zealand Aotearoa Rugby League puzzle. They are not the, <clears throat> the, the beacon. They are not the... They are not the puzzle themselves. They are just a piece in this puzzle. And keen niche case observers know this. Because we talk about the Kiwi NRL players in the NRL every week. We talk about the youngsters on the rise. And let's just look at the teams uh, left in finals footy. Panthers, Fisher Harris, he's from Northland. Broncos, Jordan Rickey, he's from Christchurch. Storm, who are the best Storm players? Or Jerome Hughes is up there. Asafa Solomon is up there. They're from Wellington. None of those dudes are from Auckland. <laughs> who, 
Who's the big hero right now for the Melbourne Storm? Will Warbrick. Where's he from? Kawado. He's not from Auckland. Like this is just a small taste of how of the presence of rugby league across Aotearoa. This is how we know rugby league is in a fantastic state in Aotearoa because there are players from Auckland. Auckland is a heartland of rugby league. But now there's players emerging and they are among the best players in the NRL. They are emerging from across the region. So I think about uh, Te Hurunui Twiddle playing for the Eels. He was the SG ball fullback for the Eels. He's a uh, Jersey flag fullback for the Eels. Where's he from? Turanga Waiwai. I'm thinking about Tavita Henare Schuster. The Roosters recruited him from Rugby Union in the Hurricanes region. He was in the Hurricanes system coming out of Palmerston North Boys High School in the Manawatu region. The Roosters defeated the Eels in the Jersey Flag semi-final this weekend. They had Henare Schuster. They had uh, Cassius T as a young halfback from Mariston, Auckland. Salisi Fakete came off the bench. He's a Manurewa junior. They had Luffy Tuanavai. He's a Waitamata junior in Auckland. So now you've got players from regional Aotearoa and the elite talent from Auckland as well coming together. If we slide over to NRLW, I've got a bit of a NRLW, NRL Wahine All-Stars team jotted down here. Most, if not all of these players, they've got pretty hearty links from New Zealand. Um, they're basically from New Zealand. They're not, it's not like uh, respect to them, Shanice Parker, Kiwi Fern, she's Australian. Brianna Clark, Kiwi Fern, she's Australian. These players have really hearty links to uh, Aotearoa, basically Aotearoa grassroots rugby or rugby league. So all stars, Api Nichols at fullback, veteran, Madison Bartlett, winger, veteran. Then we go Mele Hufunga. It's her first NRLW season. She is top five for line breaks and tackle breaks and everything great. She's my starting center in her first season. Niall Williams Guthrie. She's my starting center in her first season of NRLW. Anessa Biddle, youngster from Otara. I think she is second for post-contact meters in NRLW. In her first season of NRLW. Tyler Nathan Wong, starting half. Alongside Dragons halfback Racy McGregor. McGregor's a Kiwi Ferns veteran. Tyler Nathan Wong, first season of NRLW. Who's the young Dragons forward I've mentioned all year long? Uh, I don't know. I had... I'll know as soon as you say the name, though. Alexis Tawaniai. She is from... Alexis White... Tawaniai. There you go. Why Nui Amata. She is 18 years old, and she was... I'd say she was the Dragons' best player in NRLW. In her first year of NRLW. She's there with Georgia Hale, veteran. Aneta Nuosala, veteran. Nita Maynard, veteran. Otessa Pule played Kiwi Ferns last year. Fantastic. On an edge. Kere Hatina Matua. Raiders forward. From Manurewa. First year of NRLW footy. Laishon Albert-Jones. Knights edge forward. She's my bench utility. And it's her first year of NRLW. Tafito Lafaele. Former Black Fern. Coming off the bench for the Broncos usually, but she started a prop in their last round victory, I think. I can't remember, but she is in her first year of NRLW footy. What else we got? Mackenzie Wiki. These are just miscellaneous players. M Mackenzie Wiki, first year. Shael robbins Reti, first year. Norua Kapua, first year. Cortez Tapo, first year. Amelia Pasakala, first year. Let me... Those last few players, let me just go off the top of the dome of where they're from. Mackenzie Wickey's from South Auckland, daughter of Reuben Wiki, bit of a bit of a mixture of South Auckland regions there. So we'll say South Auckland. Shell Robbins Reti, she's from Taranaki. Kapu is from Taupo. Tipo is from the Hawks Bay. Pasikala's from Wairoa in the Hawks Bay. Right, so the the best Kiwi NRLW players, the best NRL Wahine, the best players who are going to play for the Kiwi Ferns in their upcoming tests 
the best players there, most of them are in their first season of NRLW. So we take that, we stack that on top of the Kiwi NRL excellence we see every single week. Every team has uh, players from Aotearoa in their NRL team except for the Dragons. Then we go deep into the systems of those teams. Let's go Cowboys, Townsville. They won under-21s in Queensland. Who were their starting props? Jeremiah Mataltia from Otara and Henry Tutel from Mariston, Auckland. Burley, they didn't quite win the Queensland Cup final. They lost to Brisbane Tigers. But who's the Burley Bears fullback who was fantastic and should be playing NRL? It's Keanu Kinney from Northcote. Unfortunately, Vaka Sikaheli, he had a knee injury in the final. He's a Manurewa junior. The niche case has like a pretty... The, the idea is that it's an encyclopedia of Kiwi NRL information. Who are the youngsters in the systems? Who are the best players leading um, Aotearoa Kiwis Rugby League? Who are the Kiwi NRL juniors who are now playing for Samoa, playing for Tonga, playing for Fiji like Siwa Wong? Arguably the best youngster in the NRL. He's a Burnham junior. He's a Manurewa junior. Sounds like he's going to represent Aotearoa because both of his parents fought for Aotearoa in terms of the military. Hopefully they were keeping the peace through their empathy. Yeah, nice and, understanding. And not through force. I'm kind of losing my track, train of thought here because the old mindfulness took a grip of me, but let me regain some mindfulness. See Wa Wong, he's immense. He's supremely talented. Let me think about the Roosters and players who are missing for the Roosters in their loss to the Storm. Jared Wairia Hargraves, he's from Rotorua. Joseph Manu's from Tokoroa. And then you go the Aucklanders, Satili Tupanuya, Maris Jr., Nofahu White, Bay Roskill Jr. They weren't even playing in the finals game against the Storm. What happens if they were playing? Maybe the Roosters win. Brandon Smith, the Waiheke Ram, was in that Roosters team. Siwa Wong was there. Unfortunately, Will Warbrick jumped over Fetalainga Ponga, Glenora Jr. And they also had Jackson Paulo, Northcote Jr. on the wing. Like there's so many players. You got the NRLW excellent. You have NRLW expansion opening spots up for all these Black Ferns, for all these Black Fern Sevens players who don't want to pursue professional rugby union opportunities. They want to go NRLW. And that's the this is the first year of that really taken hold because you had expansion. So that's only going to increase let alone everything we always talk about with Kiwi NRL matters. Need I remind anyone, the Aotearoa Kiwis defeated Tonga last year with no Warriors players. Now, the Warriors have played, the, some of the players have played themselves into Aotearoa Kiwis selection for sure. That is to say the Warriors are just part of the jigsaw. The Warriors are not the pure representation of rugby league in Aotearoa. And I'd actually suggest that the, uh, the bandwagon right now, the buzz, the hype, the fandom, is because rugby league fans in Aotearoa are hungry. They want rugby league. And they're not too fussed if it's the Warriors or if it's someone else, but they definitely want a connection to what they're seeing, what they're feeling. Um, the players they enjoy watching, the environment, the atmosphere. They are rugby league fans who are hungry for this kind of rugby league. And if we take the Kiwi NRL presence across all NRL clubs and all the junior systems, then we add in the fact that NRLW is making serious progress and there is an abundance of new players from Aotearoa dominating NRLW that comes together for the whole jigsaw puzzle of rugby league in Aotearoa. But it goes so deep, and I don't think a lot of people are aware of how deep those roots run right now. Yeah, that's... Um, 
I, I struggle not to hear that and then think of comparisons to the sports that I cover closely. Like the um, the A League Women is definitely one where I've been um, keeping a close track on on transfers, and there's been you know the, we're heading towards record numbers of Kiwis at Aussie clubs. It's not just that the Wellington Phoenix are there. Like obviously the Wellington Phoenix are there to offer pathways for Kiwi players, but there's also more Kiwi players at women at uh, at Australian women's clubs than there's ever been before. Um, going to hit double digits this year for the first time, and that's in a league where, unlike in the NRL, for example, like the um, Kiwi players in the A League count for Australian clubs anyway, not for the Phoenix anymore, which is nice. But uh, for the for the Australian clubs, they count as imports. Like the, you've only got a limited amount that you could sign, and those players. If you're competing for an import spot, you're competing with players from all over the world. Like it, there's football is a global game; they could be signing players from anywhere. I do think there's a couple of things that have really helped in the favor of of Kiwi players getting A League opportunities. Again, expansion is another one of them. Because although the two most recent teams, like there's two teams that have come into the A League since the Wellington Phoenix, they've had Western United and they've had Central Coast Mariners, who are starting this year. Neither of them have signed a Kiwi player yet. But because they've expanded the league, the, the season is now longer, which means that it doesn't fit new, like smoothly into the American League's offseason or the Scandinavian League's offseason, which is where you'd often get import players from those leagues coming over, spend their off months hanging out in Australia, going to the beach, <laughs> playing football on the weekends and um, you know, developing as players so that they can go back and challenge at their, for, for starting spots at their sort of day job clubs. They can't do that anymore unless it's just a short-term loan. And then A-League clubs don't necessarily want that because you've got a player who's not invested for the whole season. Um, and they've expanded the import spots as well. There's now a fifth spot, which is bring it in line with how the men's competition works. Curiously, you don't see the same thing in the A-League men's. You don't, you've only got probably about four or five Kiwis at Aussie clubs. And that's more than last year because Ollie Sale and Clayton Lewis have gone over. And a couple of them, like, you know, Dane Ingham is, um, Dane Ingham is, I can't remember if he was born in Australia or born in New Zealand, but he has dual citizenship. Uh, Storm Rue's been over there long enough that he now has dual citizenship just from um, uh, whatever that word is. He, he's acquired it from, from residency is the word I'm looking for. Um, so he doesn't count as an import player. Uh, there might be a little bit of a swing because like James McGarry going over, doing good things there at uh, Central Coast Mariners, winning a title, netting them a big transfer fee. But also the other league that stands out is the 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 basketball, the, the men's NBLs. Also at a stage where for the last couple of years, it's been the case that the best Kiwi players don't necessarily play for the breakers. They don't necessarily sign for the breakers. Some do, but others like, you know, Shea Ali has probably been the best performing Kiwi in the, in that league for the last two or three years. He was rejected by the breakers. They let him go. They chased uh, the ones who give an American kid some opportunities instead. Ellie asks if he can leave then gets a gig at Melbourne United wins at least one championship since he's been over there. One has won a defensive player of the year. He's brilliant. You know, um, led the Tall Blacks in their most recent thing. Like Breakers still have Finn Delaney. You know, he's, he's a starting level Tall Blacks player as well. But it's certainly not the case that the Breakers represent all of Kiwi basketball. Like that's just too big to be contained by one team who are doing their own thing, trying to win games, following their own sort of commercial ideas and whatever. And um, some a lot of that more questionable than how the Warriors have progressed. But I think it's the same thing in that the it's just a better state for the sport for any all of these sports where the pathways are spread out where the opportunities are spread out and you're not just relying on one team to be the sort of barometer for when they're going well the national team's going to go well because all their players are coming from that team like we saw last year the kiwis picked a squad without like they picked a 17 without a warriors player and they're still pretty good you know there's still a pretty intimidating lineup that they that they can roll out you could probably do the same thing for the these semifinals coming up. You could probably pick a, a starting 13 of players from the three Aussie clubs that are all Kiwi eligible versus a starting 13 of players in the Warriors and Warriors system that are all eligible. And that'd be a pretty, <laughs> that alone would be a pretty um pretty hectic battle if uh, you know if you could put those guys head to head, you know. Um 
it's just a good thing for the sport to be able to spread that to, to be able to spread the wealth out because also some players are just gonna you know the, the warriors can only be the warriors they they're gonna whatever way they're trying to play in whatever environment they're building there will still be players that maybe don't quite suit that um and those players need to have opportunities to go somewhere else. Or it might even not be that they don't suit it. It might just be that you're a fullback and Chance Nickel Clock State is there. Like, what else are you going to do? You want to sit on the bench or do you want to go get a starting spot for, I don't know, uh, the Dragons would be nice. They need a fullback. <laughs> I'll, I'll take some of that. It's just, yeah, it's, uh, it's the, the spreading the wealth idea, I think, is the is the way I look at that. It's just there's more talent than can be contained in one team and it's just better for all involved that that um that those opportunities are available sort of far and wide yeah i'm worried less about like this i'm 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 i don't like i care about the state of rugby league but it's more to it's more directed to people who are watching the warriors from the outside looking in and they're looking at mm. the warriors and they like a lot of the storyline around the Warriors is how is from Australians talking about rugby union as if New Zealand is this like I think a lot of people are stuck on those old school ideas and they like obviously Australians do not care in the slightest about New Zealand so they think oh, oh, sorry <laughs> they think the um it's a rugby union place and the World Cup's going on so no one's going to care about the Warriors are you insane the Warriors are at Mount Smart Stadium. That is in Auckland, New Zealand. It is the biggest ticket in the country. Let alone the fact that everyone across Aotearoa, whether it's the old school, like the funny idea, like, oh yeah, my cousin, my uncle, whoever, they know someone in the NRL. And if they don't know someone in the NRL, they probably know someone in the NRLW. But if you're not deep in the history, if you're not deep in the mangroves of rugby league in New Zealand, you probably don't know that. And a lot of it is flowing into the buzz around the Warriors right now. But I just it's it's this interesting idea where at the at the low point the Warriors weren't representing Aotearoa, and I'm keeping that same energy at the high point now. The Warriors don't represent Aotearoa rugby league. They are a part of the puzzle. And I actually think the Warriors right now, they are riding the wave of the foundations that were established during the pandemic. Because now rugby league fans are hungry. Now rugby league fans are heavily engaged in what's happening because the sport is growing and everyone, and the opportunities are growing so much in the NRL that, however, watching the Warriors is also quite fun. The defeat against the Knights. I, I've, I've drawn the common thread between the Warriors and Israel Adesanya um, when they lost. Warriors lost to Panthers, Adesanya lost to Sean Strickland. And I think it applies even more so now because at his best, Israel Adesanya with coach Eugene Behrman, it was stacking everything on top of uh, the little tricks and the strategy and doing this early in the fight to set up that later in the fight um showcasing this fake to get that fake working in two rounds to do this for two rounds so we can do that for two rounds later on that's how the warriors play their rugby league like they are they are layering their tactics they are layering their fakes and feints and trick shots on top of each other so much that i see that similarity between both of them like it's basically like there was an example where like it's just if you hit neokore short three times in a row the fourth time it's gone out the back like that is a very basic example of it and if it's uh like if if we're going out to dallin watane zelezniak's right edge well, he he gets the footy off uh, Rocco Berry one play. Next play, he's getting the footy off uh, Sean Stuckelklokster. And it's the, okay, Toe Harris has got the ball. Last time Toe Harris passed it, this time he's running. So you, as I, like the pod idea, the um, section, the checkpoint in their shape, 
every time they're making you make a decision. And I've got this idea, like the Warriors make you make a defensive decision where you have to decide what you're going to do at least two times a set. Some teams don't even do it once a set. And I think a lot of people think, oh, you should be doing it five or six times a set. Well, most run, most plays is just a player running. Like you're just trying to make meters. So you just run it straight. The Warriors and a lot of these other good teams, Panthers, Broncos, and Storm, they make you make a read, a decision, at least two times a set. And for the Warriors, it might just be Wade Egan. Then it might be Toe Harris or Dylan Walker or Fanua Blake, let alone what happens further out on the edges. And if you do that over and over again, as the Warriors did, then you have a situation late against the Knights where the game changes. So it goes, Dylan Walker comes on, you get a bit faster through the middle. But then later in the game, Fanua Blake comes back on. And it's a different look. And you've been executing those shapes over and over and over again. I think it was Watane Zelezniak's try late in the game where Greg Marzu rushed in on Berry. But Bradman Best was already on Berry. So you've got the defensive center and winger rushing at the center for the Warriors and Berry. So you have the overlap because of a defensive error. And I think that is the fact that that happened late in the game after the Warriors have layered their shape, layered their tactics on top of each other. Then you get fatigue, then you get bad decision making. And it was, uh, like if you've got three on three out on the edge, it's three on three. You just take a player, you tackle the player. But in that instance, the winger, Mazu, made a bad decision and he was trying to tackle the same player that Bradman Best was trying to tackle. That's when you have a bad defensive read. Um, and I've got some other notes here, like just other weird things, like which Warriors are playing in slow motion? Sean Johnson's the obvious one. He is playing in slow motion. Not everyone can play in slow motion. Mitchell Barnett, he doesn't play in slow motion. <laughs> Fenor Blake does play a bit of slow motion, like... With his footwork, he's freezing the defender. He's got a bit of slow motion to him. Watanese Lesniak, he's not playing in slow motion. Marcelo Montoya, he's not playing in slow motion. Maratini Okore, Jackson Ford, they're not playing in slow motion. Sean Johnson is the epitome of slow-mo footy. Wade Egan's in a bit of a slow-mo zone as well, though. I've got Toe Harris and Nickel Crockstar. They are also a bit of slow-mo where... Uh, Toe Harris in the middle, he's just got time and space to make a pass, make a run. Nickel Crocks out on the edges, very good at making decisions. So when it comes time to catch and pass or run, he's in slow-mo. And I think the centers are in slow-mo as well. Rocco Berry, Adam Pompey, their decision-making, like Sean's Nickel Crocks out on the edges, they're in slow-mo. They're not quite at Sean Johnson or Wade Egan levels of slow motion, but they are in slow motion. And another detail that I, I loved was the how the Warriors embraced the grind. Like they got off to a hot start, scored some tries, and then it just became the grind. Knights got back into the contest, credit to them, but it was Sean Johnson. I think he had over 600 kicking meters. He just kept booting the ball down the other end of the field, and it was pure Warriors Rugby League of 2023. Sean Johnson kicks long. We smash you. And we're going to smash you a few times, knowing that Callum Pong is not running the footy because he doesn't want to get smashed because he's got a bung shoulder. So now we're kicking to Greg Marzu or Dom Young. Most of the kicks against the Knights went to Greg Marzu, and we're going to smash him. And then we're going to smash Dom Young. Because we know Kalen Pong is not running the footy, which is very different when you think about it to Shans Nickel Crockstar. Because Shans Nickel Crockstar is going to run the footy as soon as he catches it. Very different fullback play to Ponga, obviously. But that's how the Warriors... The Warriors' style is far better suited to the grind than the Knights' back three. 
And there were some times where the Warriors, like Greg Masu, let the ball bounce. So if you let the ball bounce, we're coming at you quicker, and we're going to smash you again. Um, yeah, I felt like I've talked a lot. So if you can, if you want to pop off on any of those little things, can be my guest. I do like that slow motion idea, because um, it's. Yeah, I mean, like uh, when you were saying that, I was because you said Sean Johnson straight up to explain the to explain the idea. So I didn't have time to think of that, but that is yeah the obvious one. But the guy who I was thinking of as you're saying that was Toe Harris because even you remember when he made that line break in the second half, um, leading to I can't remember whose try it was, but it was a key try in the game. Uh, that Walker. kind of yes, yeah, Dylan Walker's one, um, where he then went and celebrated right in front of that little member section they have at the end of the goal at the end of the um at the end of the field there uh even when he made the line break it felt like slow motion like he's not running in slow motion it just felt like it because it was so smooth well, and i so think a lot of that yeah go just cuz that it, that's another very important detail folks need to be ready for in finals footy Toe harris he's the man i'm not going to say anything bad about Toe harris but that line break is because Kurt Mann was called offside. And what the refs do is they, they don't penalize you. They call you offside and they expect you to pull out of the play. Yeah. If you and if you don't, the, then you get penalized. Then you get penalized. So it was a fantastic line break from, from Toe Harris. But he runs at a player who has been called offside who can't make the mm. tackle. So then he's in open space and he's like, you know, he's fast and he's athletic. But the, I think the part of the reason it looked like slow mo because Kurt Mann couldn't do anything. Yeah, <laughs> and and that is happening in his head. That like the the line break comes as not as a result of his physicality, but as a result of a decision that he's made, yeah. which is just being ahead of the play. Which I think is what kind of sums up a lot of those examples. Because I didn't think Nickel Clockstad at first, because I was thinking just from watching the game how many times he ran the ball early in sets, particularly from deep, a lot of kick returns, like you're pointing out. He got bundles of meters. Like, I think he got close to 300 meters or something, didn't he, in that game? It was an insane workload. It was it was notable just how often he was taking hit-ups. That's not happening in slow motion. But when he's picking up the ball on the edges and they're attacking sets, that is that, that's where the slow motion stuff comes from him. And those guys that you mentioned, Harris, Egan, Johnson, Nickel Klockstad, all ball players in those scenarios, which I guess is what the um, I guess is what the point is, and it goes back to a trait that you had highlighted from the very start of the season, which is the Warriors' passing ability, passing ability from a number of positions, from a number of situations, and with variety in all of those situations from all of those players. Um, it's it's kind of a. a it's kind of a um, a fitting way that for how they would break down the Knights is by doing that kind of thing, which has been such a hallmark of how of their best footy throughout the season and how they've sort of reinvented this team under Andrew Webster or how he has reinvented this team and his idea. You just reminded me of a play Nickel Clockstar had. He was returning the footy from fullback off a kick and doing the anti-slow-mo thing of running the footy where it's hard to do that and be in slow motion but he was like angling towards the middle of the field and you could see the knights line were all shifting on an angle and he kind of stopped and i don't know if he did a spin or just jerked the other way but he went against the grain and he found a bit of space and i was like that's slow-mo because he was seeing where the defense was going changed his direction it wasn't a step or anything he just kind of ran that way, changed direction, ran the other way towards the space. And it was like, running into defense isn't slow-mo, but somehow Nickel Clockstar made it look a little bit slow-mo in a kick return, which is a mark of uh, what we're talking about here. Yeah, just staying ahead of the game mentally, basically. Part of the, what I was saying before about like where these players come from, their backgrounds, their sporting backgrounds... With the Warriors, you got a really interesting example in the two centers who I thought were fantastic against the Knights. Rocco Berry, as I said, he's from Greytown. And Adam Pompey is from Tuakau. So both of them played first 15 rugby, 
Rocco Berry played first 15 for St. Pat's Silverstream uh, before the Warriors recruited him. I think it was prior to the 2019 season or he might have popped up in, uh, yeah, it was in the, when the Warriors were playing in Wellington, I think it was 2019, they recruited him then and then he plays one game of reserve grade before the pandemic hit. But he's a first 15 player from, he went to a school in Wellington, but he's from Greytown, which is in the wider upper. Pompey was playing first 15 rugby for Wesley College. I think he was dabbling in a bit of rugby league, and then he gets signed by the Roosters. He comes back to Aotearoa, enters the Warriors system. And I think he had his best game of the season against the Knights. I agree. Like his runs, his tackling was really good as well. And Rocco Berry, I... I think Rocco Berry has more upside, but I don't want to say one of them is better than the other. I don't think Rocco Berry is necessarily better than Adam Pompey. He does some great things. <clears throat> I think Pompey's a bit underrated, but they're both fantastic. They both come from regional Aotearoa. They both have first 15 backgrounds, and they both were excellent against the Knights. In keeping with this theme of like Warriors players sneaky being better than their opposition, like Bradman Best was pretty good. Dane Gagai was pretty good. They weren't as good as Rocco Berry or Adam Pompey on the night. And I think that was a key reason why the Warriors won. Because anytime, again, we're thinking about the Ponga problem that the Knights posed. Anytime they went to the edges, Adam Pompey's making a tackle. He's got Jackson Ford busting his ass on the inside. Temaire Martin pops up everywhere defensively. Like if, if, if Tamaita Martin's at marker, he'll chase the bloke to the other side of the field. That's his defensive effort. And it really helps out when you helps out Pompey and Pompey's playing well. <clears throat> on the, like Rocco Berry tackles absolutely everything on his edge. And he was, when you're thinking, hold on. <clears throat> When you're thinking about the Warriors kicking to Greg Masu, that's on Rocco Berry's side of the field. So all of Sean Johnson's kicks are going to Rocco Berry's side of the field because Rocco Berry is so good at the kick chase. Where he does let the boat catch the ball, but then he does make a tackle as well. So I think that is a great representation of rugby league in Aotearoa. Even going through like the best Warriors players, where's Tohu Harris from? Hawks Bay. Dylan Watane is a Lesniak. He's from the Waikato. Sean Johnson, he's kind of from Auckland, but he's also, you know, people on the Whangaparoa Peninsula, Oriwa area probably don't want to be known as from Auckland. So he's... North, Northern Auckland. He's, he's from the Northern... Northern North Auckland. Yeah. At the moment, all the Warriors are missing is a player from the South Island. I think Jazz Tavanga spent time in Christchurch. But that's about it. They do have Tannisdale Smith, and they do have a bunch of players from the Canterbury region. Uh, St. Thomas of Canterbury won the schoolboys competition. Warriors had a few players in that team. Again, as another sign of rugby league in Aotearoa, the best schoolboy team as a college in Christchurch. So uh, there are players from the South Island in the Warriors system, uh, not necessarily in the NRL, but a lot of the Warriors' best players do come from regional New Zealand as well. Obviously, Sean's local clock star is a City Newton junior in Auckland. And if you go back, like that same sporting background, the same regional background of Berry and Pompey is there with Will Warbrick, because Will Warbrick played league, he played union, and he played AFL in New Zealand. Like, all of that is available to Will Warbrick as a youngster coming out of Kawaro. So it's easy to see how the NRL opportunities are there for men and women in regional New Zealand. When you can be a talented youngster from Kawaro and you've got opportunities to play All Black Sevens, a little bit of AFL in New Zealand, like you're not going to be a professional AFL player in New Zealand, but he dabbled in it. And then you go into the Melbourne Storm, 
where your AFL background can be very useful because you're playing for the Melbourne Storm who recognize that skill set as well as turning you into a really fine, talented rugby league player. I, like, I'm curious, you, you don't seem to remember these things very well, but I'm curious on your perception of Will Warbrick because I would have talked about him last year when he was stashed away with uh, Sunshine Coast. Melbourne Storm signed him, but then they made him play a whole season in Queensland Cup with Sunshine Coast. Round one, he's starting this season. Do you have any memories or just like that perception of Warbrick coming into some of his breakout moments this season based on our discussions, our podcast yarns? Uh, yeah, I mean, the thing that always stood out is that he's the dude who's come from All Black Sevens was sort of the um, the focus. And the fact that he was a winger targeted by the Storm as well, a, a, a team who above all else seems to really know how to um, how to develop a project player, particularly as an outside back. Like that's just something they've excelled at for the entire time Craig Bellamy has been there, basically. They know how to identify someone who maybe has a skill set that others might not recognize for that spot, and then they know how to get the best out of them, develop them, all that stuff. Um, and I do remember he he did score a fair few tries last year, didn't he, um, playing reserve grades. So that was definitely something that um, that the, the dudes who end up in the highlight packages, <laughs> like... Um, you must get a decent idea on some of the footballers who are doing well because you'd seen the same notifications as I am from videos I'm putting up, same as I do for guys like, you know, Warbrick last year or Keanu Kinney this year or whoever, you know. Um, you get an idea of the guys who keep bobbing back up. Um, from what I saw on Warbrick, and well, I mean, he had, he had a brilliant game against the Dragons a few weeks back where he, I think he scored a hat trick and he was just unstoppable and I'm like, you know, jaw dropped watching what this dude can do and then seeing what he even just encapsulated in that winning try, which I mean, I I went to the Warriors game and I'm still saying that I thought that Warbrick try was the moment of the of the weekend for the NRL for myself anyway, watching it because it was yeah buzzy as uh, the whole thing because it saw it consistently like three or four times. They'd had an opportunity to hit a drop goal and Cameron Munster had just tried to do too much. Like he, he just wanted to take all the burden on himself. And he was like, and then there were, Harry Grant tried to duck over the line where they didn't need to at one point, which just wasn't on. Like they were getting a little bit desperate there and they couldn't get a kick away. And the one time they did get a kick away was the fella um, who was playing in place of Jerome Hughes, who shanked his field goal so bad that he hit one of his own players on the back. Um, and then Munster just, <laughs> the last point is just like, hey, yeah, bugger it, we're going for a kick to the corner. And then Warbrick leaps up higher than anyone has any right to, makes an unreal catch. Like, that's the kind of thing where I, I was watching the NFL yesterday and someone took a, uh, what, not even that. It was The NFL season has started, so I've watched a few games since then. But I just on the Friday night watching that, I remember thinking, this is an NFL play. Like, this is what they do when they've run out of options. And they're in the red zone. They don't know how to get the ball over the line. And they're just like, we're going to throw a little fade to the corner and just ask our wide receiver to just go up and get it. 1v1, just go up and get it. Um, nothing fancy about the play set up or anything like that. It was a lovely kick from um, from Munster. But also Warbrick catches that like two meters from the try line or something like that. So not only does he make the NFL catch, which and in the NFL, that's it. Like you're done. You've, you've made the catch. But as long as you get your ground, feet on the ground, that's a touchdown. He still has to crawl his way through contact, reach out and place the ball on the line. The fact he did all of that, I'm watching that thinking this, there's no reason why this guy can't be the best winger in the NRL. You know, like what, what's the, what's the thing that's counting against them? He's, he's got all the physical skills. Um, he's developed so quickly. He can pull out a clutch play like that in the biggest moment of their season at that point. Um, size, speed, like this, he's playing for a good team with good players around him. We're going to put him in those positions too. Like there's no reason he can't just be the best winger in the NRL. You did get me thinking. <clears throat> well, first of all, like the, his try and Rocco Berry's try or just like, I, for sure. I thought the same thing. There was the strength just to reach out. And... Yeah. They were pretty epic. 
but you did spark like okay uh, i need to jot this down while we're talking but it's too hard the <laughs> um like a young young kiwis kind of group right you, keanu kinney he can be him a fullback will warbrick can be a winger rocco berry can be a winger um you can go perry you can go pompey you can go dean mariner they're there i don't think there's a lot of young halves so it gets a bit tricky there you got leo thompson's a forward griffin neem's a forward jordan ricky's a forward you got nofahu white with the roosters who i love like just but then going back to the warbrick and berry tries that is a legitimate center wing combination for the kiwis yeah rocco berry right center will warbrick right winger like that is there's no eligibility questions, which is kind of racist. Like they're Pakeha Māori, like that's yeah. the nature of the beast. But well, there's there's All Blacks lineage for both of them. There is All Blacks lineage. Obviously, uh, Marty Berry, the father of Rocco Berry, played for the All Blacks, I think. And for anyone interested, I think the Warbrick Fano basically invented the All Blacks. If you go through the Wikipedia page and a bit a bit of a Google history. You'll learn all about that as well. We will preview the upcoming games on our Thursday podcast, which will include a NRLW wrap. There's uh, finals footy starting there. You've got the Knights, Roosters, Titans, Broncos uh, locked in for finals footy. All four of those teams have at least two players from Aotearoa. The Titans usually have Williams, Guthrie, and Georgia Hale. Uh, Haley J. Orman Mansell isn't a top 17 player. So we'll say at least two players. Uh, kudos to the Raiders. I've loved their work all season. Nichols, Wiki, Robbins, Retty, Bartlett, Matua. They might all be in the Kiwi Ferns. Cronulla Sharks, Anessa Biddle, and Harata Butler from Tanifaro was fantastic this season. Dragons, huge group there. Nathan Wong, Racing McGregor, Toa Neo, Roxy Murdoch, Cortez Tapo, uh, West Tigers had Leanne Tofunga, fantastic at centre. Cowboys are a bit down buzz because Autumn Rain, Stevens Daly, didn't play much on the wing there. Just thinking like Stevens Daly, she's from Blair Plenty. Harata Butler, Tani Faro in the Waikato, um, Eels, Kapoor did feature a bit more later in the season. Um, but unfortunately, the Eels and Cowboys kind of sucked. Um, and Capri Paikau from Tiawa Mutu, young hooker, she didn't play a whole lot for the Eels. So, my, like, Kiwi ferns and Aotearoa Kiwis are going to be fantastic. And that is the epitome of what we're talking about, the state of rugby league in Aotearoa. I don't think people are ready for how good those teams are going to be in the coming years if they won the world cup it would have, it would have smacked us in the face right there but neither team won the world cup last year so i think it's still on the slow cooker a wee bit for people to tune in what else do we have you want to talk some uh national league football we will do some yeah, deeper previews could, yeah. to the weekend's fixtures but i am curious you've done your written previews for each league and just to get the juices flowing what are some key storylines to throw up especially like let's just keep it pure practical what are some key storylines that i need to jot down to then prepare for the thursday podcast to preview the opening round of national league football because i will be taking notes yeah well i mean i i roll through the previews um few paragraphs on all 20 teams 10 in the women 10 in the men's it is the same format for both now so last year you still had like the women's formats basically being tweaked year on year on year to get to the thing that the men's is at which i don't know if that's necessarily for the better or not but well you know it is what it is that's what they're doing um and you're nudging a little bit closer towards the fully club based format now so the women's now has 10 teams which is an expansion. There's two more than they had last year, but because there's two more teams, there's also fewer games. So instead of being eight teams, home and away, 14 games, it's which would have started by now already, you've got just the same was what the men's do. Everyone plays everyone once, either home or away. And then after 
nine games, top two teams playing the final. So that's the format. It's the same for both. Um, and the women now have, in order to add those two extra teams, one is the Wellington Phoenix Reserves team. That's definitely going to be something to keep an eye on because it's the first opportunity we really get on this kind of scale. It's only the first year as well that the Women's um, Academy and the Phoenix have had like fully competitive fixtures all the way through full teams, um, under 20s, under 17s and under 15s. And I assume they have programs below that, but those are the like competitive teams that they have, which fully mirrors what the what the Boys Academy does. So that's beautiful. Um, first opportunity to see them they will be quite young uh it's an under 20s team but i think you'll see a few players who have for example been playing in the under 16s currently the new zealand under 16s are away in tahiti trying to qualify for the under 17 world cup which will be next year um so wellington phoenix reserves that's that's always handy and the men's reserves i think is going to have an even bigger focus on them than usual too because we're seeing the first team just signing up academy players over and over and over. So those guys now know the pathway is there. You impress in this stage, you're quite close to playing professional football. You know, it's not that far away. Um, big deal there. The other two expansion, well, the other ex that's one of the expansion teams for the women's competition. The other one is the second capital team. So in order to get to two capital teams, basically what they've done is they've just taken the two best clubs. So you've got Waterside Karori, who won the Central League, and Wellington United, who was second in the Central League, and also runners-up in the uh, Ch uh, the Kate Shepherd Cup final. So unfortunately for them, they've, they've got two silver medals. <laughs> well, they're going to be in the National League, where they'll try to get a third silver medal if they can make a final there. So it's that's different. Normally, Capital has been one of the Federation teams. And the Federation teams just kind of picked the best players from the region. But you've seen last year, once they brought in the Auckland clubs, it was just so obvious that the, the there's a depth of talent, but it's you can't bring everyone together in like a two-week preseason against clubs who have been playing all year together. Like they've been working together since February, March. They have combinations. Federation teams don't. And it was only really in the second half of the fixtures we started to see Southern and um and canterbury in particular start to get a bit of a roll on it's a shorter season now so they've got even less time to do that so that's a little bit of a concern i did see um canterbury pride have released their squad everyone else no one's releasing their squads because it's just the same players they've been having everyone else's clubs is just the same players they've been having throughout the season central did release their squad nice and early which is cool although central have been wooden spooners for about four years in a row in the women's side uh, well, the women's side is the only one that's still a fair teams. They've been winning spooners for about four years in a row, and they've lost about four or five of their best players because they've just moved down the motorway to Wellington Phoenix Academy. Um, so they're going to struggle. We'll see how Southern and Canterbury adapt. Uh, will be interesting to see how those Wellington clubs go, though, against the Auckland clubs because Wellington United were pretty competitive against Western Springs in the Kate Shepherd Cup final. Like, they, they struggled in the midfield, but defensively, they held them out for a long time, which is pretty impressive how well they uh, absorb pressure there. That's going to bode them well. They've actually also played Eastern Suburbs in the semifinal. They beat them to get there. So while they were second to Waterside, Corey, they've actually had two games already against Auckland clubs in the cup. Both were in Auckland as well. So they've actually had a bit of a head start, uh, like a bit of a running start going into the National League. Um Cool for them. Men's side of things, it's just like, can anyone beat Auckland City? It's that's that's the difficult question that usually comes with the answer of no. But Wellington United and Christchurch United have both retained titles in their their own regional leagues. Both are definitely, I think, better than they were last year. They've retooled and they've restocked in a way which is not targeting like, can we be the best team in our region? They're already the best team in their region. It's targeting, can we beat Auckland City in september october november when we whenever we have to come up against them in the north in the national league so there's a bit of a target on the shoulders of auckland city and there is maybe a bit more competition than they've had in the last year or two i don't think they're gonna just i don't think it's a guarantee that they're gonna cruise into the final here um and shout out also to patoni and to manurewa who are the two teams who are here for the first time in the men's league fourth place finishes in Auckland and in uh well in the Northern League and in the Central League South Auckland representatives in the in the National League is cool Petoni getting in there is a as another fun story because they just seem to be they, they've 
they're a club that's very good on their with their media stuff. They do good match programs that are available online. They do um their their social media stuff is great. They've been live streaming their home games. Like there's just a club that seems to have a lot of good volunteers, a lot of passionate people and doing stuff in the right way. And they've been successful. Reminds me a bit of Melville last year, and then they've felt similar kind of yarns about them. Um so yeah, there's a few few storylines there and without even getting into players or anything that's just the clubs but um national league footy is going to be rather overwhelming for the next 10 weeks so i i am looking forward to that to set the scene a bit further who are like recent graduates from national league football to professional football like there is a clear and obvious link with the wellington phoenix but mm-hmm. i'm thinking who are like just examples of players who have gone from National League football to professional gigs. Uh, mate, let's go outside the Wellington Phoenix bubble primarily. Yeah, well, there I'm just whipping up my um, my Flying Kiwis long list here to see. There's The Phoenix one is definitely a common one, but that's also, as you say, the obvious one. Um Certainly on the women's side, you've got a lot of A-League players coming through. Like Devin Jackson is one who signed with uh, Canberra United last week. Uh, Ruby Nathan's going to be playing for Canberra United as well. Um, They've come directly, like neither of them played for the Phoenix. They've come directly through. I think on the men's side, the most obvious example would be Alex Grieve at St. Mirren, who went straight from Birkenhead to St. Mirren. Uh, They did have like a little um, kind of memorandum of understanding or whatever you want to call it between those two clubs. St. Mirren had kind of for some reason, for some unknown reason, did linked up with Birkenhead as like a sister club kind of thing, which is how they hooked up the trial for Alex Grief. But then he, you know, he went over there, he trialed, he earned a contract. He now scores goals for them sometimes. You know, he plays most weeks, usually off the bench, but he's in the team. He's gone from being one of the best National League players to playing regularly in the Scottish Premiership. That's a pretty handy deal. Um uh, Corbin Piper went from Birkenhead as well. He signed with Wexford in the second tier of, in Ireland, but he's been playing a lot for them. You could almost say Marco Stamanich. I mean, it's a little bit different because he was probably more about the Ole Academy link for, for setting up what he did as well as, you know, his national youth team um, performances. But he, he didn't come through the Phoenix and he did play National League. Not a lot of National League, but he played a little bit. And he's now maybe the best all white in, in terms of form and, and performance. Um, uh, flicking through some of these other ones, most of them, most of the pros that we've developed in the last few years have come through the Phoenix or Ole. But um, uh, Oliver Fay played for Auckland United last year. He's playing in uh, Swedish lower tiers at the moment. And looking at the women, because I'm sure there's a couple outside of the A League. There, um, Emma Pleinenberg at the Feyenoord Academy, Chiara Baselli, Sampdoria Academy, both played National League. Uh, oh, I can't say that one because it hasn't been announced yet. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, yeah, no, there's a there's quite a. It's definitely something that um, increasingly does happen. Like maybe in the past you couldn't necessarily go for you'd have to find that in between step from national league to um, professional football. Not as much these days, particularly for young players. You've also seen guys like you know Oliver Colotti didn't sign anywhere, but he he went on trial at quite a few um, uh, English clubs, and particularly he will be playing for Auckland City in this national league. And I expect after that he will just go on more trials and hopefully sign somewhere decent. He's a very good striker. Uh, um, Kyan Donkers is a, is another one um, at the NEC Nijmegen Academy in uh, Netherlands. So, you know, there's, there's quite a few of these stories. Most of these people also played age grade level for men's or women's teams, but um, they're also like those players. That's also telling a story in itself, isn't it? It's saying that the best age grade players are already playing national league men's or women's. You seem to specifically divert away from A League players, but is there like there's are there players in the A League who went to the A League from National League football? Well, I mentioned a few of the women's ones, but that was kind of more of an obvious uh, what do you call it pathway? Um, you know, 
Well, it, it's also it's the same as the Phoenix too. But on the on um, well, I say the same as the Phoenix is the Phoenix are signing National League players as well as the A League clubs. Um, Rebecca Lake is a good example of someone who's dominated as a centre back in the the Canterbury United Pride for a few years, and she's recently signed. Uh, Michaela Foster was a good example. Like these are not players who came through their academy; these are National League players that the Phoenix snapped up. Similar to in the past, say uh, Tim Payne on the men's side would be someone like that, although he had played some professional football earlier. Um, but you know who the best example is in in the A League men's right now is not a New Zealand player; it's Brian Keltak at mm. at, um, at Central Coast Mariners, championship winning centre back in his first year outstanding and he, he just he was so good he for Auckland City it was like he had he had the ability but being an Oceania player it was like someone to someone to bring him on they would have to use an import spot on him and the Phoenix didn't seem to want to risk that and perhaps to be fair to the Phoenix they just weren't in the state of their club where they could do that they kind of needed their import players to be um, proven overseas veterans um but Caltex come in and hopefully change the conversation a fair bit in a few of these boardrooms by just being that good that quickly, winning a championship. You know, there's, there's the the level he came from is not, um, you know, that he he was an established National League player for several years. He, they didn't sign him out of Vanuatu. He had moved from Vanuatu to. New Zealand and a couple of different things. Like I remember him playing for Tasman United in one season and before he was playing for Auckland City. So he played for a few different teams. Um, but he was basically like the, he was signed out of the National League as someone who had developed in the National League. And now he's one of the better center backs in the A-League. Like, and instantly too. It wasn't even a, it wasn't something that needed a few years of like, um development to get to that point he just turned up and was great like that's that's a level that can be aspired to from any of these dudes in that in that national league beauty we will look forward ahead to the weekend on our thursday episode of the niche cast and we will be busy writing things for our website the niche-case.com in the meantime big up yourself enjoy our tero and the our tero sporting action Kia kaha, stay beautiful, chit